Hi everybody, Scott Stanchfield here. Let's start talking about Jetpack Compose. Jetpack Compose is the new user interface kit that they've designed for Android. And it's quite a bit different from the old way we used to do things. The old user interface setup was very imperative. You'd first of all describe the user interface using XML, but then you'd set up a bunch of instructions to fetch the parts of the user interface and update the user interface along the way. There was a good bit of separation between how you describe your user interface and how you actually would interact with it. Sometimes it was kind of hard to, to figure out how the actual user interface and the XML related to the code. It got much worse whenever you'd want to conditionally include parts of the user interface. So maybe you'd hide parts based on other data on the screen. You basically have to describe your entire interface in the XML and then selectively show and hide parts of it. With the new Jetpack Compose user interface, you describe what you want using functions. And in those functions, you just have whatever code you want in Kotlin. So you can have ifs, you can have whens, you can have loops. And this will help you create the user interface dynamically. So every time it goes through, it describes the user interface however you want based on your data. This ends up creating a tree of elements to represent the user interface. It doesn't actually create the user interface at the initial point. And then any type of changes, whenever you have these composable functions called again with new data, will actually change the tree, and that will be used to determine what to change on, on the screen. Most of the magic behind the scenes here is done using a compiler plugin. It'll look for some annotations you'll put on your code, such as composable for the functions, and create wrappers around these to capture the data, check the data coming in, and make modifications to that tree. Once it has that tree, you can actually realize it on the screen by drawing things. The first time the user interface is run, it's called composition. It runs through all of your functions that you define as composables, creating a tree behind the scenes to represent that data. So for example, if I had a composable function called family, you could think of there being a node in the tree called family. The actual representation behind the scenes is a little bit different than that. They're actually using something called a gap buffer data structure to manage it, and it's much more efficient than a normal tree structure. But conceptually, it's easiest to think of this just as a tree. And their gap buffer is basically a flattened out representation of a tree. So in this particular example, we have this family composable function. He creates his family node. Underneath that, he's calling the column composable function. So we can put that here as another node. Inside that column, we're calling text. So we'll see the text created over here. And then for each of our children, notice the loop here, we're calling child. So boom, boom, we have two children, let's say, for example. Then the child function is called. He, he calls row, which creates these row nodes. And underneath there, each of those rows creates two texts. So just by having a normal function call, we're creating a tree to represent our user interface behind the scenes. Now, once we've got that, all of the parameters that were passed in are kept track of. So at each node, it tracks what parameters drove the creation of that node. On the next time we go through taking a look at this tree, it takes a look at the parameters that came in. And if the parameters have changed, then it will recompose. So it'll actually execute the code again to create either a replacement for that node or an entire subtree replacing that node. Or perhaps it doesn't even have that node in there at all. Think about these child names. If child names were empty, we wouldn't have any of these children. So the children would get removed. Each of these composable functions declares part of your user interface. And the more of these you have, the finer grained you have control throughout the rendering of the user interface. One of the nice things is when you have these very small, low-level functions, they can be skipped completely based on if the data changed or not. If instead you tried to put everything in one big function, then you might not have as much granular uh, efficiency on re-rendering the user interface. One thing you have to be careful of is whenever you have calls to composable functions inside other composable functions, those functions can actually be executed in any order or parallel. And what they're doing with this is, remember, you're just describing the tree, the actual re-rendering of that tree, the actual execution of parts of the tree can happen in any order for efficiency. And depending on the system you're running on, they may even have it set up to call those renderers in parallel. So it's very important that you don't assume any specific order that things are called. So for example, don't assume that you have added your parent names before you've created your child or children inside the tree. 
It may actually happen in a different order there. One way you can make this easy and safe is to not have side effects inside your function. Think about it as having a unidirectional data flow. You pass data in, you pass in some callback functions, and anytime you need to make a change, you call those callbacks. So your data flows down through the tree, through all the calls that you have inside of your functions. And then whenever something changes, it's actually making a call back up and works its way back up to the top to change some data on the outside. For example, your composable might look something kind of like this, where you have several inputs coming in. They could be primitives, like such an int and a string, or they could be some other objects, preferably something that's immutable or stable. I'll get to that in a minute. And what'll happen is then these can be kept track of and the Compose framework knows that unless these values change, it doesn't need to recompose itself. The callbacks we're passing in down here using functional types. So this input one, we're saying pass in some function that takes an integer and then doesn't return a value. It's just going to process that. Pass in a function that takes a string and process it. Pass in a function that takes some object and processes it. These will allow you to have this function be completely self-contained and not worry about the data outside of it. It just takes immutable values in and then calls functions to tell the outside world that it needs to have something change. Note that you don't necessarily have to have a one-to-one -one relationship between your inputs and your callbacks. You could have callbacks acting on a larger object that's composed of some of the inputs that change, or maybe some of these inputs just aren't going to be changed by the function and you only need a couple types of functions being passed out to uh, make changes to some of the data that's coming in. When you pass data into a function, sometimes Compose can figure out if those values are changeable or not. If it's you're passing in, for example, just a string or an integer, Compose can say, oh, you know what? Those are immutable types. The values coming in aren't going to change. So I can look at the value and say, if those are the only types of things passed in, then the function doesn't need to be recomposed if the, if the values haven't changed. For any type of custom types, you really want to shoot for the types being either immutable or stable, preferably immutable. Immutable means that the type cannot change and it should be deeply immutable. So that means that if you have a person object and inside maybe he has an address, the address should be immutable as well. And you want to make sure that anything reachable from there cannot change. It's a value that's set and never changes after that. Once you have these types of data structures, sometimes Compose can figure out, oh, hey, it looks like that entire data structure is immutable. Usually if you have interfaces involved anywhere in there, it's not going to be able to make that assumption because it won't necessarily know all the possible subtypes. There are some cases in Kotlin where you can use something called a sealed interface where at compile time will know all the possible subtypes. So if you know when you're designing something that the only way that instance can be created is such that it will be immutable, mainly everything inside of it are vowels. And if you point to something like a list, the list is immutable and the data inside the list, all those data are immutable. If that's the case, you can put an immutable annotation on the data type and that makes it easy for Compose to say, okay, the programmer is promising me that I can just take a look at the value here and see if it's changed or not. And it can do that by using the equals function on those types. Now we can go a half step up from here and use something called a stable type. And I recommend you use these very sparingly if at all. The idea behind a stable type, and once again, if you mark it as at stable, you have to make sure that it's deeply stable. So anything reachable from the object is also stable. The idea with stable is that, first of all, equals will always return the same result if you have two different two instances. So the same two instances coming in, you always get the same result. But then more importantly, if you have any public properties that can change, those can let Compose know that they've changed. And the easiest way to do that is if you implement them using mutable state. So instead of directly having a var string, you'd have a val name, which is a mutable state of string. If the data being passed into a function is a stable object, then Compose knows it can just use equals to see if the values change. And Compose also knows that it will always be notified for any data that's not immutable, so any mutable type of data. Using either of these annotations helps Compose optimize the whole recomposition, which can make your user interface much, much more reactive to the user.
But ideally, what you want to do is prefer immutable types rather than having data that can be changed from inside of a composable. So here's an example of using the immutable annotation. And we might start off in this composable down at the bottom here where we have an int, to string, and some immutable object being passed in. That immutable object, note that all the fields inside of here are vals. So those properties, thing one, thing two, and thing three, can't be changed. And then anything reachable that's not a primitive also has to be immutable. So we'll see some other immutable object up here. It's a class that is also marked immutable. And you want to make sure it's immutable all the way down. So for it's stable, what you would do here is have a class that has items inside of it which are stable. Maybe they implement mutable state of. Maybe they reference some other class in a mutable state that itself is stable. Or maybe this other, val other object is a value inside the stable object. So stable pointing to another stable object directly that's, you know, you can't change which stable object it's pointing to. Any of those types of cases, Compose will be able to look at any of the pieces that it uses, like the thing, thing two, thing three, thing one, and see if they've changed over time. If so, then it'll know that it needs to recompose. Sometimes you'll see this done with a view model, where the view model is kind of your top level gatherer of your data for your application. And sometimes you'll have all the properties in there be mutable states. I prefer to have the properties in there be flows because I like to have a separation from the view model from my user interface. So the same view model could actually be used in different interface frameworks if you wanted to. As soon as you start pulling in the mutable state into the view model, now you've tied that view model to compose. But that is an option. You can do that so you don't have to have flows. I just prefer to have the flows and use Kotlin coroutines because I think that works really nice on its own and then adapt it once you're in the compose side of the house. Now state instances can be pushed into composable functions. Like in this example for this counting button, we're passing in a state int for num clicks and the state can be observed by this composable function. It'll know when to change it. On the caller side, outside of the counting button, we created this mutable state of, and it could be completely outside of compose, so maybe before the set content function that we'll see in a little bit, or inside some composable function. Let's suppose this was you know, somewhere in our hierarchy of functions. We've defined this number of clicks and we're passing it in. So right now we're seeing we're actually passing the state itself inside. His onClick function, we're just using to update the value, to increment that value here. When the value is incremented, the counting button function will be re-executed because it was listening to that state object. Now, a better way to handle this is to try to set up our functions so that they don't have any type of mutability involved in them. They don't have anything that they have to explicitly listen to. So if we it created this counting button too, just passing in num clicks int and then an on click, we can just explicitly pass in that integer and now this whole function just has a fixed integer value. It doesn't actually have to worry about checking to see if it's changed. The wrapping that the annotation compiler provides for us, the Kotlin plugin, is going to take care of checking to see if that value's changed. So what we end up with is from the top level here, we can say num clicks by mutable state of. And what this by does is it creates a Kotlin delegate for the property. This object created by mutable state of, the mutable state object, can be used via a get value and set value to manage the num clicks property. What that means is that anytime somebody tries to read num clicks, so they're calling the getter on num clicks, the by will delegate that getter to the get value on this mutable state object. Anytime you try to change it by saying num clicks equals something or num clicks plus plus, it's going to call the setter on that mutable state object. Now this get value and set value function are actually extension functions provided by the Jetpack Compose framework, and we'll see those in the, uh, the actual code example I'm going to walk you through. But the main idea here is we're hiding the fact that we have to take a look at the value like we did over here before, and not explicitly passing the value in here. It just looks like we're passing an int into this function, and here it looks like we're just updating that int. So this counting button function, I think, is a little bit more stable now. Uh, not stable in the same way as a stable annotation, but it's something that you can reason about a little bit more because it's just taking an int and just returning a function. So that's a much cleaner function. When we define this state, we can actually save it inside the compose tree. And they do that using a function called remember. 
And the idea of remember is that it calculates a value inside this lambda once when the function is initially composed and won't recalculate it unless the key passed to it, like this number of times, changes. Now what I mean by this is when you first come in here to actually initialize this, in this first example here, we're going to create a mutable state so it's a little box that can hold a value. Think about that as just a, a box that can hold, in this case, an integer value. We're going to put that into the compose tree by using remember. It will stay until this useless button that we've created here goes away from the tree. So if it's not, not included anymore, then this variable we're holding on to will go away. Remember, we'll expose that value directly. So the mutable state of will be exposed from remember. The by, once again, will delegate num clicks get and set to that mutable state. So what this does is kind of create a local variable inside the tree to hold on to. If instead we had said var num clicks equals zero, this would actually just create a local variable here that gets executed every time this function is recomposed. What the remember does for us is creates this value once, and this way if we update it, the value can actually change and isn't reinitialized every time this function is executed. Now sometimes you're going to have a value that might be expensive to calculate it, and you're not going to actually calculate it too many times. For example, I created a, a, a graphing function. It was a composable function that would display a graph on the screen. It was a fairly complex graph. It had a bunch of lines and had custom icons for each point in the line. When I'm creating this, doing that type of graphic work, it can be pretty expensive. There'd be a lot of calculations. So sometimes I might want to create some calculations based on the size of the canvas that I have to deal with. And while the application's running, that size isn't usually going to change. You know, it might change if you change the surrounding layout and move things in or out. But if the user is just looking at it and interacting with it, you're probably going to have the canvas size for that graph staying exactly the same. So what I would do is pass into the function some parameters that represent the screen size. And then using remember, I compute the value once and hold on to it. So the second line is kind of a little bit more along that line, what we're doing there. I say remember based on the size of the canvas. And then inside here, I calculate the things I need to calculate, like how big the rows are. If I have you know 10 items here and I want to divide them across the entire screen, I'm going to do some division based on the size of the screen. And there's probably some other things in there that are a little bit more complex than that. But the idea is you only want to compute those once. If I just used a normal val time string equals blah, 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 it's going to execute that every time this function is recomposed. And you really don't want to do that if you don't have to. So we're going to, during, during composition, figure out this time string. So it's going to say, let's say we pass in a three, it would say times, times, times store that inside the tree, and then any time number of times is different, it's going to recompute that. So it's a fairly useful thing. Now, of course, this button itself is pretty useless, but it's just kind of an example of how you can store this data. Now, a little note about why this button is useful, useless and why I'm showing this example. If you look online, you're going to see quite a few examples that look like this, where you'll see this num clicks by remember type thing, and then the button has an on click that directly updates it. And it's all happening just within this function. And this just is not realistic. Usually if you're having a button do some kind of click, there's some bigger action you want it to do that's going to be happening outside the scope of this function. That's where you really need to have that function passed in that says what to do when a click happens. So instead of actually managing the state inside of this function and then just updating the state here, which is completely useless, we would be passing a value out to the caller. Now that said, there are some cases where you might need to keep track of a value inside. You know, maybe it's a scroll position or something like that. And we'll talk about those later. One little note here, if you have to hold a value over a configuration change, so for example, if the user rotates the device, remember that that's going to blow away the activity, which will end up recreating the entire user interface. And if there was some state that you care about retaining across that configuration change, you're going to want to make sure you remember that appropriately. So anything that's remembered inside of a composable function, you're going to want to use remember saveable instead of remember. So, you know, for, for example, again, scroll position. If the user has scrolled halfway down the list and rotates, 
they're probably going to want to still be in that same location once the rotation is finished. Using remember savable will take care of that. Now other types of values, if you're just computing a value based on a value coming in, using a normal remember is fine because you're going to just compute that value once when you start recreating the user interface. And then all, all the recomposes, it's not going to rerun that. Remember savable will be able to save any values that can be stored inside of what Android calls a bundle. That includes any of your primitives, string, anything that's marked as parcelable or serializable, or arrays of those. We'll be talking about parcelables later on in the course. Serializables are a Java construct, and I recommend you avoid those when you're doing Android programming. They're actually much slower, and parcelables are really only used to transfer data from one process to another or hold things in memory. Serializables are really meant to be, to be stored to disk, uh, or able to be stored to disk, parcelables cannot be stored to disk. So the types of things that we'd be doing with these really only concern keeping it in memory. Now, an easier way to deal with things is if the, if the state isn't something that really only applies to just inside the function, just put it in your view model. The view model is going to sit there as long as the user is in that activity, even if the activity instance itself is being recreated. So some general recommendations on your state. First of all, any internal state, keep it really, really minimal. And the types of things you should be doing there are just if there's an expensive com uh, computation that doesn't change. So things like I was talking about the, the canvas for a graph. When you get those size parameters coming in, you may make several calculations just dividing up the size. And it's nice to just do that once and not have to do it multiple times. Um, or if there's state that only matters at that given level, so a scroll position perhaps. Now scroll position is a little iffy there because it might relate to other parts of your application depending on what you're doing. But in some cases, the position that you're at for a scroll really is appropriate to do in a remember or remember savable. Most of your state in an application should be in your view model. So the view model is going to be a, a your your ground truth for all the data in the application, and it stays no matter how many times the user interface goes away and comes back. Whenever you're defining your composable functions, make sure you're passing all the needed state in. Don't depend on any state that's defined outside. Generally, you don't want to use nested composable functions because that gives you access to external state, and it makes it much harder to test those composable functions because they have to be inside some other context. Composable functions, you can just make all top-level functions. That's the easy way to ensure that you're not relying on some external data, although they could actually access data defined inside the file. So generally what you want to do is have the composable functions defined at the top level of the file and don't have other variables at the top level. One approach that I like taking is that your top-level composable takes your view model as an argument pulls out the pieces that it needs from the view model, sets up functions that will update the view model, and then passes down the data and those functions into any lower level composables. That way, all the lower level composables only care strictly about the data being passed in. The data being passed in is simple. It's not a big view model object. And you can set up tests for it. You can reason about them much easier to make sure that you know it's doing what you want it to do. When you take this approach, your parameter lists tend to start to get pretty long. If you think about it down at the low level, you have small functions that just take a few parameters. But in order to get to those, those parameters have to be passed through any higher level functions. So the higher level functions might need to keep track of all the individual fields for a person to pass them down into all the fields that are going to be displayed on the screen for a person. So what you may want to do is group those together. And a person is a good example of that, where you have a person object that has a name and an age and an address and other things like that, that's an object that groups together a bunch of state that's going to be used in lower level functions. And you can create some other state carriers like that along the way. Moving your state farther and farther up the chain toward the top is what's known as state hoisting. So instead of having state defined internally in your individual functions, we pass it up as much as possible so the definition and the management of it happens outside of all the functions, or as many functions as possible. As we'll see, taking this view model at the top level approach has a very uh, simple way of translating between your view model layer and your uh, actual user interface.
So on that previous slide, I mentioned nested composable functions. And if you remember from the database example that I showed in the database lecture, I actually used a nested composable function. So if we look here inside the UE, this is just kind of a slimmed down version of the user interface from there. At the top level UE, I had this nested common button function in here. And the nested common function, button function was just taking advantage of this scope that was defined in the UE level. And this is not good for testing because now I can only use this common button inside of this UE function. I can't use it standalone in a test. And also, I don't have all the data being passed in here that I use inside the function because I'm using this scope that's defined outside of it. So a much better way to do this is to create your common button at the top level, just like this, and explicitly pass in that scope. So all the data you need, all the objects you need, should be passed in. And this was intentional when I wrote this example so I could show this and talk about why it's a bad idea. The user interface from the, the previous example was kind of a hand wave. It's kind of like, okay, just trust me, this will work. But in this particular case, this was actually not a good way to program it. Now you have to be very, very careful about side effects and how side effects are used inside composable functions. 